محمد رسول الله لا إله إلا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدًا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كلام الله عز وجل وخير الهدي هدي نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار رمضان is the month of dua and our prophet صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم told us that there is nothing more honorable to Allah than dua, than invocation. And the Prophet himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was given the concise of speech. And he used to make a lot of dua. And over the 23 years of his life as a messenger and a prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam There are only few of his dua Yet they are full of meaning Unlike what we usually do and say When we ask Allah Azza wa Jal We make a very long list Due to our ignorance Due to the fact that we are not certain That Allah knows what we want so we list every single thing. And this is not the, the sunnah of the Prophet والسلام, who used to make a general dua, having full tawakkul, full trust in Allah Azza wa Jal to fulfill his wishes. Today, we will study one single hadith where the Prophet والسلام, used to frequently ask Allah Azza wa Jal. So this is a recommendation for us to do what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam used to do to ask Allah Azza wa Jal what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam used to ask. It is easy to learn. It is easy to memorize. And it's best if we memorize it in Arabic. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam used to frequently ask as Abdullah bin Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, said and the hadith is in Sahih Muslim. So it is the highest grade of authenticity. The Prophet used to say, Allahumma, inni as'aluka al-huda, wal-tuqa, wal-afaf, wal-ghina. Four things. As easy as they come. Allahumma inni as'aluka al-huda, wal-tuqa, wal-afaf, wal-ghina. But let us break these four words in whatever is time allocated for this khutbah. First of all, the hadith translates to, Oh Allah, I ask you, I beg you, 
for guidance, for piety or righteousness, for chastity, and for wealth, or to be self-sufficient. So guidance, how important is guidance in our lives? It is so important that it is the core of the Fatiha. When you praise Allah Azza wa Jal, when you glorify Him, what is the conclusion? al-mustaqim. You are seeking Allah's guidance. 17 times minimum per day and night. In every single rak'ah, you ask Allah Azza wa Jal for guidance. And this is what the Muslims do every night in taraweeh specifically and in night prayer in general when they say Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt you seek Allah's guidance and Allah the Almighty in the Qudsi hadith says O oh my servants all of you are astray you're going in the wrong direction except those whom I guide so ask me for guidance and I shall guide you so Allah is ordering us to seek his guidance compared to what people nowadays do they don't do that on the contrary if you say to someone Allah yahdik may Allah guide you he gets angry do you think I'm crazy do you think I'm misguided why do you say this to me any normal Muslim would say Ameen may Allah Azza wa Jal guide us all and guidance is required in everything we do you require guidance in your work. You require guidance in how you treat your wife, your spouse, your children, your colleagues. Because without Allah's guidance, you're misguided. And you do the wrong things and you make the wrong decisions. And guidance is divided into two types. One type, every single one of us is able to guide others too. And this is directing them to the right direction. Allah Azza wa Jal praised the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam by saying, وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَىٰ صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ Verily, you guide to the straight path. But this is guidance that is limited. It's only directing the way. As they say, you can lead a horse to water. Everyone can lead a horse to water but you cannot force the horse to drink and this is the most honorable and favored type of guidance which is only is in the hand of Allah Azza wa Jal to make you believe to make you implement what you know this is only in the guidance of Allah and this is why Allah Azza wa Jal told his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he, he was saddened by the death of his uncle Abu Talib without accepting Islam. You verily do not guide those whom you love. But Allah just said that you guide to a straight path. You guide in directing people. But you cannot make them or force them embrace what you guide them for. This is only in Allah's hand subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path and to embrace it. And this explains why we see a lot of the Muslims, why we see a lot of the Arabs who are born Muslims from Muslim fathers and grandfathers failing to abide by Islam. Because it's a cultural thing. But while those who revert to Islam, who accept Islam, they abide by it more stronger and more strongly than the originally born Muslim. A lot of the Muslims, unfortunately, face and complain of hard hearts. They find this stiffness in their Iman. They lack the ability to attain khushur in their Salat. They can barely cry when they recite the verses of the Quran. And why is that? This is because Allah did not guide them yet. May Allah Azza wa guide us all. Why didn't Allah Azza wa 
guide them yet because of their sins because of their indulgence in whatever angers Allah Azza wa Jal and this is why Allah described the Jews in the Quran by saying so because of their breach of their covenant we cursed them and made their hearts grow hard because of their breach of their covenants Allah made their hearts grow hard and stiff and because the sins we commit day and night especially when there's no one watching us except Allah if people are watching us we would not be sinful but we only sin when we close our doors and there's no one with us in the room and this is why Allah Azza wa Jal stiffens and hardens our heart how many of the Muslims do not pray Jum'ah altogether the most important prayer in the week the Prophet said alayhi salatu wasalam, whoever abandons three Jum'ah in a row out of negligence will have a seal placed upon his heart how many of us hear the preaching, hear a sermon every single Jum'ah and it doesn't change a thing in their lifestyle? In my masjid, I so often come out of the Jum'ah sermon and I find people outside smoking, speaking to each other. MashaAllah, the sermon was very effective, it was very emotional. And this does not stop them from going home, watching a movie, listening to music, cheating, lying, dealing in riba, etc. All of this because Allah Azza wa Jal had sealed their hearts due to their ignorance and negligence. Allah says in the Quran, and we shall turn their hearts and their eyes away from guidance as they refuse to believe therein for the first time. Guidance is very important. And this is what the Prophet says, Allahumma inni as'aluk al-huda. One word, but look, to these words whom were get, who were given to or which were given to the man who was given the concise of speech sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam it is without doubt that we need the guidance of Allah azza wa jal however guidance by itself is a theoretical thing it is not only the knowledge of halal and haram because every one of us know the halal and haram. We all know what is halal and we all know what is haram. And some of us even has the ability to give the evidences backing it up. However, guidance as a theoretical thing is required. And if you get it, you must implement it to be guided. Because there are Jews and Christians who know the Quran better than some of the Muslims. There are rabbis among the Jew, Jewish community who know the ayahs and who don't know the hadith and Sahih Bukhari, subhanallah. But they're disbelievers. They're not Muslim. So can we say that they're guided? No. They're misguided because they did not implement. And once you're guided and you make this into action, you reach the second word. Allahumma inni as'aluk al-huda wa tuqa you reach the level of piety, of righteousness. Because now you are walking the talk. And by this we mean that you are implementing the guidance of Allah Azza wa in your actions. So what is taqwa? Taqwa is fearing Allah Azza wa Jal, is keeping a barrier between you and hellfire, is doing what Allah instructed you to do and staying away from what Allah Azza wa Jal has forbidden you to do this is taqwa as simple as that so you don't have to be a nuclear physicist if you abide by what Allah Azza wa has instructed you you're part of the muttaqin and you're part of the righteous and the pious even if you're illiterate even if you don't know languages even if you don't know how to write your name at the side of Allah you're the most honored person with him subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is why knowledge itself is not sufficient the hypocrites come to the prophet والسلام, and say we believe that you are the messenger of allah and allah falsifies their belief by saying that they are liars 
So you have to um, implement this. And this is what Allah ordered the whole of humanity. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, and verily we have recommended to the people of the scriptures before you and to you, O Muslims, that you all fear Allah. Ittaqullah. The most frequently repeated word in Prophet's sermon, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and in the Quran as well. And this is the advice the Prophet gave to his companion Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he sought his advice. O Prophet of Allah, advise me. The Prophet says, Fear Allah wherever you are. Whether you are in your locality or you travel abroad, fear Allah Azza wa Jal. And as a sub-product, it is part of piety. It is part of a taqwa. Whoever fears Allah Azza wa Jal, there's a subcategory that comes underneath and that is Allah would grant you chastity and chastity is part of piety so why segregate it because it is very crucial and dangerous you might be a pious person when it comes to finance you might be a pious person when it comes with dealing people and moral conduct but when it comes to the hidden desires or to the public desires people fall weak and vulnerable and that is why you have to see this as a fruit of your piety that it produces chastity allah azza wa jal the almighty says and come not near to the unlawful sexual intercourse verily it is a fahisha and an evil way any sexual intercourse that is not legitimate it is a fahisha it is something of a major evil way so when you ask allah azza wa jal specifically to grant you chastity you're asking him to guide you and you're asking him to help you to avoid all types of fornication whether minor or major and this includes not sending your gaze away and this is a big fitna. We have the fitna of zina nazar, of looking to haram things through our TV sets, through our computer screens, and through our mobiles. It follows you, it stalks you, even when you are in the masjid, when you op open an email, when you open a WhatsApp message, it comes to you. Nudity, pornography. So you need Allah's help because without Allah's help, you are vulnerable, you are weak, and you're bound to fall into sin. You need Allah to protect you from zina of listening, music everywhere. You go into a mall, you go into a shop, you go into a restaurant. People are playing music and you see brothers who are practicing, not saying a single word. Akhi, this is your money. If you go in, tell them, either turn it off or I'm leaving. But do not sit where munkar and evil acts are being done and you do not say a, thing, a single thing. And you seek Allah's refuge by asking Him to protect you from the major sin, which is fornication, which is what would eventually happen to a Muslim to a person who sends his gaze freely, who listens to haram freely, who free mixes, who touches without any boundaries to the opposite gender, this is inevitable to happen. It may take a while. It may take longer. Shaitan is not in a hurry. He will prepare you and he will take good care of you until you fall into this major sin. May Allah Azza wa protect us and protect our children from all major and minor sin. I, see, I say what you hear and I seek Allah Azza wa Jal forgiveness for me and for you. So ask Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala to forgive us all. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala al mab'uthi rahmatan lil alameen. نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين 
The fourth request, the fourth word that the Prophet asked Allah for is Al Ghina. And the Arabs know that Ghina usually means wealth, money, financing. However, if you look at the seerah of the Prophet والسلام, you would find it contrary to this. He never pursued any worldly gains. If you were in the shoes of the Prophet والسلام, literally, you would have a number of shoes, a number of dresses, a number of uh, uh, rides, a number of houses. But the, the Prophet never had this. He would finish the Salat in a fast fashion and leave to the extent that the companions thought that there was something wrong and dangerous that took place. And then he comes back and says to them that I remembered in Salat that I had few dirhams of gold under the bed that came. So I did not want to spend the night with it in my possession. So I rushed out and gave it in charity. What kind of a leader was he? What kind of a ruler was he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Was he in pursuit of dunya? La wallah, he was never in pursuit of dunya. However, how does he ask Allah for wealth, for ghina? Well, the scholars say ghina has two meanings. And this is explained by the other hadiths of the Prophet alayhi wa This is how a student of knowledge understand the verses of the Quran and the beautiful words and, and teachings of the Prophet ﷺ. Through, through understanding the Quran itself holistically and also searching for other meanings that coincide with all through the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. It was the Prophet ﷺ who used to invoke Allah Azzawajal by saying, O oh Allah, make the provision of the family of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam No more than sufficient So he's asking Allah Not to open the dunya For his families Not to grant them more than what they need He only wants the bare minimum And this shows you That the Prophet ﷺ Did not intend Wealth and money When he said Al-Ghina Abu Hurairah may Allah be pleased with him said that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Richness, richness, this is ghina. Richness is, does not mean having a lot. Rather, richness is contentment. So this is what the Prophet is asking Allah Azza wa Jal for. The real true meaning of richness, which is contentment. Whomever Allah Azza wa Jal make him content, with what he had given him, Wallahi, he is the wealthiest person on earth. I know millionaires who have everything that each and every one of us wish to have 1% of, and they're never content. There is a millionaire who has a jet plane, and he's never content for his travels. He said, I know a friend who has a 777. It's three times bigger than my air, uh, airplane. And the one who has a triple seven is envious of that who has a whole fleet and can travel whenever he wants and wherever he wants. Subhanallah, no one is satisfied with what Allah gives him. Makes that person the most miserable person on earth. And even if you don't have anything except what carries you throughout the day, you have only little food that carries you throughout the night. Tomorrow you don't have food for tomorrow. If you're content, wallahi, you are the wealthiest person on earth and you are the happiest person on earth. This is a glimpse of the dua of the Prophet ﷺ. If you want Allah to be pleased with you, make dua. And if you want to anger Allah, do not make dua. The Prophet says, ﷺ, whoever does not make dua to Allah, Allah is angry with him. La ilaha illallah. Allah instructs you to ask him so that he can give you 
and he would be pleased by that. And if you do not ask Allah Azza wa Jal, he would punish you in hell for not asking him. So do we ask Allah Azza wa Jal ser seriously? Do we ask Allah and invoke him with humility while displaying and portraying our poverty? Do we ask Allah Azza wa Jal for every single thing in our lives? Or do we ignore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? We should fear Allah the Almighty and we should supplicate. We should invoke. We should make dua in this blessed month of Ramadan. Ask Allah Azza wa Jal as much as you can to whatever you want, specifically at the preferred times of answering. This is when you are in sujood, whether nafil or fard salah. Ask him as much as you want and as much as you can. Before giving salam from the salat after the tashahud and before concluding the salat, this is a time of answering in the last third of the night, just before fajr prayer, an hour or two. Raise your hands, supplicate to Allah, praise him, offer salutation to the Prophet ﷺ, and seek his guidance. When it is time for iftar, just before you break your fast, with a piece of date, invoke Allah Azza wa Jal. Oh Allah, guide my children. Oh Allah, make me the best of spouses to my spouse. Oh Allah, cleanse my heart from hatred, envy, from bad feelings. Invoke Allah Azza wa Jal. And wallahi, and by Allah, you will find Allah Azza wa Jal answering your prayers. I'm going to conclude my sermon with invocations. It will be in Arabic. And uh, I pray to Allah Azza wa Jal that he accepts what we have said and to make all of this sincerely for uh, his face. Allahumma ghafir lana warhamna wa aafina wa afu anna wa tawallana bi riayatika wa la tahrimna rabbana aatina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa qina adhab al-nar Allahumma inna nas'aluka al-huda wa al-tuqa wa al-afaf wa al-ghina Allahumma inna na'udhu bika min al-hamm wa al-gham والحزن يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم فرج كربنا وكرب المسلمين اللهم انصر إخواننا المستضعفين اللهم انصرهم وكن معهم لا عليهم اللهم وحد كلمتهم واجمع شملهم واجعل كيدهم على من ظلمهم يا عزيز يا حكيم اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وإسرافنا في أمرنا وأصلح لنا في أزواجنا وذرياتنا واجعلهم قرة عين لنا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأقم الصلاة